The Apostle Peter was far from perfect. He was a sinner, just like all of us. And yet he was chosen as an apostle, he was one of the first bishops of the church, and he identified himself as a shepherd of the flock of God. Furthermore, he saw the leaders of the church, what we would call pastors or priests, in the same shepherd role. How could a sinful man or woman ever be compared with the good shepherd himself? In this final session, we will explore the way in which Christian leaders are shepherds. In our reflection on the great texts that set forth the Good Shepherd, we've noticed again and again how the image of the Good Shepherd is an image for God. It sets forth all kinds of wonders that can be explained through the use of that image and metaphor that uh, cannot perhaps be as clearly set forth any other way. Then this same image for God became, as we saw, brilliantly in the Gospels, an image for Jesus. And that also is a great uh, enrichment of our understanding of the person of our Lord, particularly because of the fact that he is telling us about himself. It's not Paul and Peter and others, but it is Jesus himself saying, this is who I am and this is how you can understand me. Finally now, at the end of our series, we want to look at the two major texts in the New Testament in which we move to a third stage. The first stage, the Good Shepherd is God. The second, the Good Shepherd is Jesus. And now the third is, the Good Shepherd is early Christian leadership. And for this, we have a brief statement and parable from our Lord himself on this subject. And finally, in conclusion, we find uh, Peter in 1 Peter 5, picking up this image and using it to talk about himself and to talk about the church and to talk about leadership in the church and to talk about the great shepherd who is for him and for us, Jesus himself. So first of all, let's take a quick look at Matthew 18, verse 10 to 14 and pick up a few ideas from it. The text reads, take care that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you, in heaven their angels continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now, as we try to understand this, it's quite clear that Jesus is concerned about those who despise the little ones. The phrase here is best understood not to mean children, but to mean those who are young in the faith, those who have just come into the faith and don't understand very much about it. This, this can be debated. I grant uh, the validity of those who see this as referring to children, but when we look at the language itself and how it's used in the rest of the Gospels, I think it's better if we read it as referring to those who are new in the faith. Ton mekron is the word. Sometimes there's a little phrase in some of the early texts, who believe in me, probably an early pious note trying to explain that this refers not just to children as such, but to people who have come to faith in Christ. Perhaps at that time, some thought it was children, and the scribes said, no, no, this doesn't mean children. It means those new in the faith. Now, it is, it, we're told here, do not despise these types. It's very easy for organizations and particularly the larger the organization, the more this happens, 
to despise the powerless. There is a will to power, if you please, that is a part of the human sinful condition, and this creeps into the life of the church. And too often we admire those of power and are drawn to them, and those who are on the fringes who are powerless, they get neglected, and in that neglect there is also a whiff of they are despised. This brings us then back to the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit. It's easy for organizations, particularly political organizations, and all human organizations have political components to them, to pretend that they are interested in the poor, but because to show forth an interest in the poor or the powerless gains you more power. So you make these noises, hoping people like you. Oh, it's a nice guy. He's interested in the powerless. But actually, you're saying it in order to gain more power for yourselves. We also live in a culture, particularly for those of us who are Americans, in which the acquisition of power is a very tempting kind of a reality because we are the world's superpower. And so you notice the advertisements, if you want to be uh, interested in power, why here's the clothes you should wear, and here's the kind of car you should drive, and here's the kind of this or that will, that will show you forth as a person of power. I remember reading a marvelous essay by uh, C.S. Lewis called The Inner Ring. And in it, he, it's, a, a, I think, a graduation speech that he gave at the college from which he graduated. But he, in it, he talks about the fact that there are really basically two kinds of people out there. And one kind is always interested in the acquisition of power. And he said those who are engaged in this on the top levels, they're willing to do anything, and the easiest of which is murder. And countries will get, do terrible things in order to gain and to achieve and to hold on to power. But then he says there's another, and he, call, he says organizations like this, the people who really run them are not necessarily the people who sit in the front, at the front desk. He said, usually there is a little circle of people who really control things, and these he calls the inner ring. And so folks who join that or kind of an organization, they're listening very carefully to find out who's involved in the upper ring, and then they do whatever they can to become a part of that little clique that really decides what is really going on in this organization of which they're a part. And at one occasion, I was privileged to be honored by the college from which I graduated back in Illinois. And I was being inaugurated into the Hall of Achievement, whatever that means. And along with it, a judge woman from Southern California was also being inaugurated. Each of us was invited to give a few remarks. And so I picked up on C.S. Lewis and talked about this, uh, because C.S. Lewis says there's another option. And the other option is to become a specialist, a, a skilled craftsman in your trade. And he said, if you choose that one, every other skilled craftsman in the world will know it. And of course, we all know the kind of reputation that C.S. Lewis has when he chose that way. He didn't care who was running the organization. He didn't care whether he was on the right committee. He didn't care whether he was a part of the inner ring that really ran the organizations that he was a part of. All he cared was to be a craftsman in his chosen profession, and for which he did brilliantly. Well, I presented this and said, this is the path that I have chosen. I didn't try and get myself a job in influential institutions and get my articles published in the most important journals. That wasn't who I was, and that's what, never what I tried to do. I tried to be a craftsman in my profession of the teaching of the New Testament. Well, I got done, and the judge stood up and verbally with, hmm, with a considerable sort of um, twinge of, of hostility and contempt, sort of verbally gave me the backhand and said that uh, she was uh, very definitely interested in power. And this was a noble, actually the most of all noble professions. 
all right, so be it. That's, uh, I've recovered from that little public uh, smashing because I was amazed to hear her how important it was. You know, I rang her bell. She didn't like somebody saying this. And then I remember at the Tentur Ecumenical Institute in Jerusalem where I taught for, for 10 years and we had a new group of people every three months. And the first evening we sat around, as we sat around the dining table, everyone was getting acquainted and who are you and where are you from and what do you do and or what confessional group are you a part? They were mostly Roman Catholics, uh, quite a number of Anglicans and some stray Presbyterians and occasional Baptists. And so this one lady said that she was an uh, information manager. Oh, that, that, that's, that's interesting. Uh, the rest of us, uh, after we kind of shook our heads, we asked her, well, uh, could, you, uh, could you explain what you mean by information manager? Well, it turns out she was a librarian. And so then we asked her and said, well, now, librarian is a very honorable profession. Uh, why did you tell us that you are an information manager when the common understanding of who you are and what you do that would communicate the most to us would have been to have called yourself a librarian? She said, information manager is a power image. Librarian is not. Okay, uh, yeah, I heard that and was kind of dismayed at it, but uh, she was blunt and she was upfront and a very pleasant woman, uh, but she made quite clear what it was that she was uh, trying to do. Jesus says, no, be careful that you don't, do not despise these little ones. Well, now, why, why shouldn't we do that? And the simple answer is, in heaven, their angels continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. In the Middle East, you never get anything done unless you know somebody. We've got a wonderful Middle Eastern proverb, can, can roughly be translated, he who has no backing gets beaten up on his stomach. So you've got to know somebody. You can't even get an application to ask for a telephone unless you know somebody who can slip into the inner office and say, we've got Dr. Bailey out here and he's a nice man and he's a good friend of the Arabs and he's come here to serve in such and such a capacity and I'm sure that we will find it possible to be nice to him. And if you've got a good wasta, the word who does this is called wasta, to whom the fellow who has the papers in his drawer uh, knows and owes something, then he'll open the drawer and give you the application. That's just simply the way life works. So this text says, aha, these people who are very, they're powerless and very easily despised, they've got wasta. They've got somebody in the inner office. Each of them has an angel who doesn't just wander into the inner office now and then. They are continually before the face of my Father who is in heaven. Look out for these powerless ones. You're going to get in big time trouble if you aren't nice to them. It's a vice, nice turn if you understand and are in touch with Middle Eastern culture. And then he goes on and says, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, or it sounds like it's his fault, or the text can be translated, has been misled. If you translate it that way, then it brings back into uh, harmony, brings the text back into harmony with what we read in Matthew, where it's really not the sheep's fault so much as the shepherd's fault who didn't care that much to watch this sheep. Do you not think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the hills? There we go. We're back in harmony with, uh, with Luke in which the 99 are not at home safely in the fold, but they are out on the hills. And he leaves them and goes in search of the one that went astray. Now we're talking about early Christian leadership. And let us put it this way, that the person who is the shepherd, let's call him the pastor or the, or, or the, or the priest, the, the elder, the word elder is presbyteros, and you take out a couple of vowels and you get the word priest. So the person who is the responsible as shepherd for this flock will be set free to go and look for the one that is lost and leave the ninety and nine on the hills if the vestry lets him. 
Now, I've known some vestries out there, and their attitude is, we're paying you, Sonny, and we're paying you to take care of us. Now, uh, we are far more important than this one that you're spending a lot of energy in, or this group of people that you're spending a lot of energy in, and we're not really sure that we want them in the club anyway. And so, uh, yeah, uh, what are you doing out there looking for the one that is lost when you've got 99 and that's quite enough to take up all of your time? Yeah. Okay, we face that. If, if you were talking about a missional church, this is not a problem. If you're talking about a country club church, it's a huge problem. The shepherd has the mobility to care for the one that is lost and is not bound to the needs of the majority, we're told in this particular parable. Uh, yeah, I remember a wonderful story I got from a Presbyterian missionary to China. His name was, uh, was uh, Andrew Roy, and he was not a clergyman. He was in education, and he stayed on in China after the communists took over, thinking that he could still do something with the schools where he was at work. And sure enough, he got arrested and put on house arrest and for two years and finally was released. And the communist authorities would come at least once a week trying to argue with him about the superiority of the communist system as over against the New Testament. And one of their primary illustrations was of the shepherd and his hundred sheep and the one lost sheep. And they would say, now look, this Jesus fellow whom you follow is really, he doesn't understand reality because what matters is the people. Now, if you lose one here or you lose one over there, you can't leave the people and go after the one that was lost. It's got to be left behind because the people is what really matters. And Andy Roy would answer them and would say to them, gentlemen, you are mistaken. In that, when the shepherd goes after the one, the 99 know that if we get lost, he will come after us. The shepherd gives to them the ultimate security because he gives to them the confidence that if they step out of line and get lost, they too will find the good shepherd coming after them. And, said Andrew Roy, if he doesn't go after the one that is lost, he gives to the flock the ultimate insecu uh, insecurity. They know that they are going to be lost if he, if he stepped. It, the gr greatest security and the greatest insecurity is offered to the sheep. If I get lost, he'll come after me, or if I get lost, he won't come after me. He'll leave me to die. And that was his ply, reply. I thought it was a pretty good one. And if he finds it, we're told. In Luke, we're confident when he finds it. But here there's some question. Amen, I tell you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. We're still back now to the church as to whether or not the church is that kind. This particular congregation is that kind who does rejoice more over the one that is lost than over the 99 who never go astray. There is an uncertainty about finding it. Uh, and we notice that joy, again, is central to the account, and it becomes uh, very important for the story as it unfolds. We find this resentment of attention being given to the one who is lost in the great story of the, what we call the prodigal son. There is a party at the end of the story. Now, mind you, it's not a party celebrating the return of the prodigal. The community hates him because he took the money when he had no right to, he shamed his family before the village, he went off and lost it, and now he comes back with nothing in rags. And they don't like him. If the party is in celebration of the return of the prodigal, there's not going to be one person show up at that banquet. They are there to show honor to the father who at great cost managed to win his wayward son back to his own heart. They're amazed at this, and they will come to offer their congratulations to the father. Now, what about the older son? Is he rejoicing? No way. 
And when the father offers the same costly love to him, all he can do is shout and scream insults at the father and accuse him of favoritism. Why aren't you making a big banquet for me? The little boy in the street told the older son that the banquet was not for the prodigal, but the banquet was for the father. But he couldn't hear that. All he saw was, there's a banquet, my brother is there, and I don't like it. And if he finds it, we're told. Amen, I tell you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these should perish. Here we get back to the very tricky, unsolvable theological problem of trying to understand the nature of the will of God. At the end of the day, we can't. At the end of the day, we affirm that God is sovereign and what happens in history is what God wants. And we are free and responsible for everything that we do. Paul puts these side by side, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And in the next minute, he's talking about uh, fear and trembling, for God is at work within you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The two are true. They are side by side in the Lord's Prayer. They are side by side here. Very well, now it's time for us to take a quick look at the great text with which we will conclude in the fifth chapter of 1 Peter, in which Peter says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, mind you the word elder, presbyteros, can also read priest, and that's what we're talking about, and a witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shared in the glory to be revealed. Hmm. I exhort you as an elder, he says, as a fellow elder. I'm not sitting riding herd over you from some exalted level, but I can sit. He was definitely in charge. He was definitely uh, running things. He was definitely the first amongst equals, if you like. However, you define that relationship. He had a position of leadership over the others. But he says, I am a fellow elder with you, a witness to the sufferings of Christ. Hey, Pete, you weren't there. Remember? What do you mean saying a witness to the sufferings of Christ when we all know that you ran away? John was there, but you weren't. Now, is Peter sort of you know, trying to get people to forget that he was one of those who ran away? I don't think so. I think he's being honest and open. And I think he's talking about the agony of rejected love, the deepest agony known to the human spirit. And the cross was only the ultimate expression of that agony not in any way to lessen the reality of the physical suffering at the cross. Pilate, in his own brutal way, was kind to Jesus by having him beaten almost to death and then crucified so that he would die within a few hours. Many times those crucified would hang on these crosses two and three days. Again, to in no way lessen the reality of the physical suffering of Jesus, Many in the torture chambers of the Second World War under the Nazis physically suffered more than Jesus. They weren't allowed to die except after X number of days. Jesus died in a few hours. So the sufferings of Christ, Peter observed the agony of rejected love. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And this was painful. And every time he presented the truth of God as he understood it and presented the reality of who he was as the divine presence in the community and he gets flack and hostility and anger and this hurts. And Peter is a witness to it. And then he says, Peter does, as well also a participant, a koinonos, of the glory to be revealed. 
Now, this is often read to be understood as a part of the Mount of Tr Transfiguration, in which they did see the glory of God in the face of Christ. John says they saw the glory of God many times. Here, Peter is attaching the sufferings of Christ and the glory of Christ. And how are we to understand this reality? The word glory, to us, we think immediately splendor. But when you look, the word is doxa in Greek. When you look at the Hebrew equivalent, it is the word kabod. And kabod in Hebrew has to do with weight. The Latins have a word for it, gravitas. In Middle Eastern culture, to call somebody a weighty person, so-and-so is heavy. Fulan tegil is a great compliment because a heavy person means that they are, is weight, meaning distinction, honor, reputation. The person who is rajul tegil, a heavy person, is wise, honorable, trustworthy, noble, offers sound advice, will help you solve your problems. In trouble, you turn to them and their thoughts are deep and they are well balanced. And in trouble, you turn to them because you know they will solve your problems. A rajul khafif, a light person, is somebody who is scatterbrained, shallow, opinions are of little value, not to be relied upon, irresponsible, not to be taken seriously. Paul, when he describes his own very stunning and amazing list of sufferings in 2 Corinthians 11, three times I was shipwrecked, and on and on and on he goes, when he gets to the end of the list, he says, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not in great indignation? His response to his suffering was gravitas. That suffering produced greatness in his life and in his soul. Now, suffering doesn't need to produce gravitas. It can produce bitterness, despair, desire for revenge, fear, paralysis, the use of past sufferings of, as a club with which to threaten others into bending to the sufferer's will. Victimism as a self-serving ideology is alive and well. But listen, if you will, please to Aeschylus, 5th century BC Greek tragic dramatist who fought at Marathon. And here's what he writes. It is God's law that he who learns must suffer. Even in our sleep, pain that cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart and on our own, despite against our will, comes wisdom to us by the awful grace of God. Wisdom, gravitas, and suffering. Is this a part of the power of the cross in which we see in the suffering of Christ also the face of wisdom and of all that glory has to say to us? Lawrence Vanderpost, a South African who suffered and almost died in one of the Japanese prisoner of war camps, talked about his suffering and he writes as follows. Persons who have really suffered at the hands of others do not find it difficult to forgive or even to understand the people who caused their suffering. They do not find it difficult to forgive because out of suffering and sorrow truly endured comes an instinctive sense of privilege. Recognition of the creative truth comes in a flash. Forgiveness for others as for ourselves. For we too know not what we do. Peter goes on. He 
tells his readers, tend the flock of God that is in your charge, exercising oversight, exercising episcopacy, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you do it. Well, how do we understand that? Of course, Peter thinks and imagines that you have in mind all of the great images of the Old Testament and in the New, where we have God, the Good Shepherd, acting with the sheep, where it is all described. This, is, this gives content to the phrase, do it as God would have you do it, not for sordid gain, but eagerly. Apparently, they had a problem of financial uh, improprieties in their time, not only in ours. Yes, and finally we get to the end of the story. Do not lord it over those in your charge, but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will win the crown of kabod, of glory, that never fades away. That crown awaits us, and it is a crown of glory that if we also are able to fulfill our ministries as shepherds of part of the flock of God in the style and in the way as of God as seen in the great shepherd, we too will receive and experience that glory and that gravitas.